we get one more very rich one with the Holy Roman Empire, but we're also moving out. And yeah. <laughs> whether, that, whether that works or not, I don't know, because I think Martin's point is that you have to you have to zoom in to get any sense of what's going on in this field. But in any case, our presenters are Lucas Schultz, Bill Rankin, and Martin Lewis in that order. And I invite Luca to the podium. All right. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Karen and Martin, for organizing this uh, fantastic conference. And uh, thanks to uh, Salim and also the Ramsey Map Center staff for, for hosting us. Um, I contribute to this conversation as a scholar of the Holy Roman Empire and also as a historian who tries to formulate his arguments visually as much as verbally. In recent decades, historical research on the Holy Roman Empire um, has, revi um, has revised many of the negative evaluations um, that were uh, common in the older historiography. So historians have um, um, chosen new sources, new methods. They um, tend to emphasize, for example, the empire's effectiveness um, at ensuring peace, uh, religious coexistence, and the independence of its uh, least powerful members. And this younger historiography has also proposed a range of new concepts and metaphors to grasp the empire's peculiar spatial and um, political makeup, borrowing, um, for example, from the language of fragmentation, um, entanglement, network, and more recently, fractality. Um, now, this varied and evolving conceptual repertoire stands in contrast um, to the relatively stable graphical conventions with which historians and their collaborators have represented the empire on maps. With important exceptions, um, thematic maps of the empire at all scales emphasize territorial contiguity, exclusion, and unity, and rarely convey the manifold forms of territorial competition, cooperation, and ambiguity that were so characteristic of political life in the empire. So in this talk, I want to explore how um, such non-exclusive forms of political organization have been and can be represented on maps. Uh, efforts at mapping the empire's political division as a patchwork of contiguous polygons are sometimes questioned on practical grounds. Um, shared power arrangement, entangled or overlapping claims of dominion, as well as continu continuous territorial divisions um, um, are just some of the factors that complicated um, the empire's political um, landscape and any mapping efforts. But many historians nowadays would go further and argue that mapping the empire as a fragmented political landscape is not just technically challenging, but it, that it frames the uh, empire's political geography in ways that are conceptually problematic. Um, Falk Bretschneider and Christophe Duhamel, two French historians of the empire, argue that the notion of fragmentation tends to obscure the connections between polities and um, suggests an aleatory splintering without internal coherence. Others argued that the patchwork maps distort perceptions of the empire as riven by chaos and conflict. And Andreas Rutz uh, recently pointed to the political motivation that stood behind um, um, the strong reliance on fragmentation metaphors in the 1930s. A key reason why historians emphasize the empire's political fragmentation was a desire to support nationalistic narratives of German history. Now, the problem, and we have seen this uh, uh, throughout this conference, is of course not exclusive to the Holy Roman Empire or to the discipline of history. Um, it, it, and it is also important to note that the preference for clear, unambiguous modes of visual representation is not unique to historical cartography, but reflects much broader patterns of ambiguity and uncertainty omission in the world of, um, of data visualization. And there's a very interesting recent study by Jessica Hallman at Northwestern, Northwestern on this. Now, historians have offered creative propositions for how the empire spatial order can be reconceptualized. Um, one of the I believe boldest and most elaborate recent proposals stems from um, um, these two French historians I just referenced, Christophe Diamel and Falk Bretschneider, who offered a, um, a, a discussion and a critique of the spatial imagination of the empire and suggested to understand its spatial order as fractal. So they propose fractality as an alternative to the network metaphor because the concept describes the empire's multiple levels of political organization and the connections between them. All parts of a fractal are similar to the whole. They are all connected with each other, but it's impossible to make out an unambiguous hierarchy between them. And they have no clear center or symmetry. Now, fractality is primarily a conceptual proposition. 
The principal aim is to propose a new way of studying the history of the Holy Roman Empire, not so much to highlight new avenues for visualizing the empire's political complexity. But efforts to visualize rather than just verbally describe the, empires, um, the empire should be seen as, wor as a worthwhile intellectual endeavor in their own right. Bill Rankin has emphasized and modeled the important role that cartography can play in spatial history, a field that is often more interested in generating and processing data um, than, than on visualizing it um, in, 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 uh, in, in creative ways. And historically, different graphical formats have played an important role in conveying competing scientific paradigms, for example, in evolutionary theory. So uh, uh, Julia Foss uh, contrasted recently highly, the, the highly geometrical language of diagrams produced by many late 19th century zoologists with the graphics of Charles Darwin, which conveyed a sense of disorder. And um, she argues that to Darwin, rather than distorting the human perception of nature, the lack of order seemed to represent it. And I don't think, I'm not arguing that we are anywhere close to the Darwinian revolution when it comes to the history of the, of the empire. But it is significant that historians of the empire are now rediscovering the cartographic representation of the empire's social and political history as a meaningful avenue of research. Um, so there's a French-German col research collaboration initiated by Brechtschneider and Duhamel um, that, that is attempting this at Oxford, a group led by Peter Wilson aims to remap the Thirty Years' War. And here today, I want to share some of my own modest attempts at visually making sense of what happens when claims of dominion overlap. Now, one of the most salient characteristics of political maps of the Holy Roman Empire is the sheer density of political claims to dominion. Um, patchwork maps, um, like the one you can see um, on, on the wall here, are effective at highlighting the degree to which competing claims of dominion structured the empire's landscapes, uh, landscape of power at all scales. The close juxtaposition of shapes encoded with different hues suggests a space saturated with power, a dense mosaic of authority which assigns political power a prominent place in the cartographic composition. And one potential drawback of representing political density in this way is that it elevates the importance of political power in the map's visual hierarchy, making it easy to forget that to the populations inhabiting these spaces, um, 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 that the populations inhabiting these spaces often experience political density as a weakening rather than as a strengthening of political authority. Uh, James Scott had developed a series of metaphors and schematic representations to make visible these paradoxical effects of political density. Um, he called them mandalas, so circles in which power concentrates at the center and gradually fades into the absence, um, into absence at the outer perimeter. And it's, it's a simple yet forceful representation of how one area could fall into the ambit of more than one overlord. So you have these areas of dual sovereignty that could easily um, become cases of mutually canceling, weakened sovereignty as local chiefs and their subjects enjoyed greater um, autonomy. Now, this idea that Political density can lead to mutually canceling claims of dominion and Scott's schematic representations are easily transferred to the early modern German lands where local populations often found, and there is a rich historiography on this, uh, often found productive ways of turning competition between authorities to their advantage. Um, and one could give many examples, but one I would like to briefly discuss is the exercise of grace. Grace was a key mechanism of sovereignty in old regime societies. Acts of grace could neutralize or short circuit the rulings and decisions of competing rulers um, um, or, or subordinates. And the Holy Roman Empire was no exception. Subjects could appeal to the grace granted by the emperors and the imperial institutions. In fact, subjects petitioned the emperor for a wide range of reasons to obtain privileges for money, uh, sorry, privileges or money, for support in disputes around inheritance or debt, or for protection in matters of criminal justice. And in two thirds of the cases, these decisions fell in the favor of the petitioners. Now in this map, I plotted the places of residence of, residence of over 13, sorry, 1,300 subjects who petitioned the emperor between 1571 and 1614. And you can see some, um, some, some clear patterns. So um, um, many of the uh, petitioners um, resided in Prague where the emperor um, 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 resided. Um, you can see uh, a prevalence of imperial cities in the empire Southwest, um, but also in the, in the Austrian maps. Now, the same data can be visualized in continuous clusters of varying density. In this map, the light clusters indicate areas in which subjects were particularly prone to petition the emperor directly when they came into conflict with local authorities. 
the relationship of background and foreground is inverted. Darker shades indicate areas where imperial acts of grace were less likely to limit the actions of local authorities and territorial rulers. In contrast, the lighter areas indicate holds in this public of power. Subjects in these areas did not hesitate to appeal to the empire's highest authority when they came into conflict with local power holders. And the fluid aesthetic generated by uh, the clustering algorithm uh, reinforces the dilution metaphor. Now, of course, this representation of what you could call the geography of grace is highly schematic. Um, the archival evidence it is based on is mediated and incomplete. Um, neither were all petitions successful, nor does the existence of a record really tell us much about its concrete effect in local power dynamics. Um, nevertheless, I hope that this map of the empire's geography of grace um, illustrates at least what a visual argument could look like could look like if competing claims of power are framed in terms of density, not, not of density, but of dilution. Uh, let me show my second example. Uh, networks are frequently suggested as an alternative to the fragmentation metaphor. Monica Smith, for example, argued that the network model is better suited to represent ancient polities than um, territorial blobs because it emphasizes the importance of state level control over road infrastructure and nodal points are more cost effective to control um, than, than, than the control of territory, um, but also because networks frame the coexistence of polities in terms of cooperation and association rather than separation and exclusion. In the case of the empire, networks map, network maps have been employed to visualize competing claims of dominion over the empire's roads, rivers, and those who moved on them. Conflicts concerning the governance of the mobility of goods and people in the empire were often framed as matters of safe conduct. Safe conduct could take different forms and meant different things for different people. It could be uh, could describe the act of escorting a traveler. It could be a letter that was issued to debtors or, or felon, felons, a duty to pay transit duties, or an abstract concept. And it was a key framework in which authorities and mobile populations used to negotiate the protection, the promotion, and the regulation of different forms of interpolity mobility. And a key spatial characteristic of safe conduct was that the right was anchored to stretches of roads and rivers that did not always overlap with the ruler's other claims of dominion. This map here um, represents uh, the most important roads on which rulers in the southwestern corner of the empire held or claimed rights of safe conduct in, 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 in one of the empire's most um, politically dense regions. It was designed by regional historians, uh, three, three historians, um, and published in a historical atlas for the region of Baden-Württemberg in the 1980s, a genre of historical cartography that is, is uh, not widely known outside of, 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 of Germany, but that is noteworthy for its detail, its originality, and diversity. Now, the map is interesting because instead of framing territorial or political claims as contiguous and closed polygons over which power is exercised uniformly, it gives them a linear shape, conveys the idea of states as spatially malleable entities whose power is concentrated to different degrees in different locations and settings. And if we zoom in, the map is noteworthy also for the rich graphical language employed to encode the ways in which these polities shared, alternated, claimed, or disputed their control of the roads. Competing claims over um, the same roads or rivers regularly led to confrontation, but many polities found arrangements that allowed to guarantee the exercise of safe conduct while maintaining each side's claims. Some rulers appointed shared officials who performed the safe conduct duties um, over contested routes in the name of both parties. And when multiple um, officials um, uh, were appointed for the same road, they sometimes escorted travelers in opposite directions sparing the escorts a lengthy wait in the countryside and the difficult negotiation of a common boundary. And this map here uses colored arrows to make visible an arrangement that defies the conventional imaginary of fragmentation, exclusion, or separation, dominion shared by orientation. Let me come to my last example. Another circumstance that complicates effort to represent the empire on maps is the frequency with which its political geography varied in time. Countless acquisitions and swaps made the empire's territories a highly dynamic landscape, a close up of which would, re would have revealed, and here I'm referencing Joe Whaley, uh, one of the leading historians of the empire, would have revealed something akin to a mass of amoeba, a constantly changing shape. Now, I would argue that making visible this variation over time is not just a question of cartographic accuracy or detail, 
time variance could be constituted a constitutive element of the geography of shared dominion. One example is the history of the Freis condominium, a small district in the borderlands between Bohemia and Bavaria. Um, it was a condominium established in 1591 as a, a provisional solution, but the two parties were unable to agree on dividing up the district between them, and it remained in place uh, until the mid 19th century. Now, what's interesting in this in this condominium, and let me see if I can. Is there is there a pointer? Um, Oh yeah, that's good. Um, all right, so maybe I can use the yeah, is the mouse visit? Yeah, it's maybe the easiest. Um, okay, so um, so this 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 entire area enclosed by this line is the condominium, and then a sub a section of this condominium. So the the area that is marked by this dotted line in this map here, this was um, a temporal condominium. That means that high jurisdiction over the over the nine towns in this district switched every year on July twenty nine. In the first years, the annual switch of dominion was even formally announced in the marketplace in Neualbenreuth. Now, existing historical maps of the Freis district represent this temporal condominium with textured lines or, or sometimes do not differentiate it from the remaining condominium at all. Now, this map here is a very simple attempt on my side at representing the Wechsel Freis as qualitatively different from other condominium because high jurisdiction over the space altered every year. There was no moment in time at which it was exercised jointly. So I used a very simple but well-established cartographic technique for visualizing time variance here called small, small multiples. So like snapshots in time, the maps are arranged in a sequence that shows how high jurisdiction over the space changed, one could say rather oscillated um, over time. It's a simple and probably not entirely satisfactory attempt to visually represent this condominium, not as a space governed and adjudicated jointly by the two regional powers, but as a space in which high jurisdiction was shared, yes, but always exclusive. Now, the cartographic preference for exclusivity and continu contiguity mirrors a long historiographical focus on monocratic, contained forms of territoriality and views of the empire's early modern history as an incubation period of modernity. In recent decades, historians have revised many of the assumptions uh, projected into the metaphor of fragmentation and proposed alternative ways of conceptualizing the empire's spatial and political order. And here I've discussed three simple ways in which non-exclusive forms of dominion can be accounted for on maps, by reframing density as dilution, by emphasizing the importance and idiosyncrasies of infrastructure, and by considering temporality and diachronic modes of power sharing as constitutive of the empire's political geography. And the images I presented here are experimental schematic propositions. They are proofs of concept more than historical maps. But I hope they help to make the point that our graphical repertoire can be as limiting or as generative as our uh, conceptual apparatus. Thanks. All right, um, so I'm gonna start by thanking again, Karen and, and Martin for organizing this. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I wanna also add my thanks just to the other presenters, to the Rumsey staff. I, I've really enjoyed uh, the conversation so far. I'm looking forward to our last little bits of time together. Now, when Karen and Martin asked me to join this last panel, uh, the idea was that my talk would be as much a response to the conference as a whole um, as it would be a presentation of my own work. Um, so in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to be kind of mixing these together a bit. So probably the most central recurring theme of the last two days uh, has been that maps are one of the main anchors of a certain mythology of so-called modern sovereignty, but that maps have not and perhaps even cannot represent the reality of actual sovereignty, what uh, John Agnew recently called uh, sovereignty regimes. The archetypal map um, of the Western tradition is clean and tidy, simple shapes and lines. The actual practices and institutions of belonging and state making are fragmented piecemeal dynamic. Um, they are more like lattices or, or laceworks or fractals. Um, these are from the um, phrases from the papers. 
um, than they are um, simple jigsaw puzzle pieces. And this seems absolutely true historically and theoretically, um, both in the past and the present. But what I wanna do is to zoom in on kind of the foil to this theme, um, which is that a better alternative than polygons of the typical political map uh, might be some kind of pointillism. Um, so we heard this um, a few times. Um, uh, it was in Franck Billet's paper, although not his presentation. Uh, we saw Albert Penck doing this. Uh, Luca just mentioned something um, similar. And this is definitely something that I have participated in myself uh, as well. Um, and I'm approaching these comments with a certain amount of, of self-reflection. So ideas of points and pointillism uh, have been central to much of my own work, uh, both as a historian um, and as a map maker myself. And the question I wanna ask is if, if uh, basically why pointillism? And why is this the right answer today? Uh, and if it is better than the alternatives, why is it better? And what I wanna suggest um, is that if pointillism is the answer or one of the answers, um, it's not necessarily because we scholars are coming up with some new and exciting uh, ways to show the world, um, or that we are at the vanguard of some new emancipatory cartography, but rather um, because pointillism is in fact one of the main ways that power operates today uh, in ways that are historically specific. So as scholars, I think we should see ourselves uh, as both observers uh, and participants in this form of power, um, and I think that that might be helpful so that we can be um, reflective about what we're trying to accomplish. So I don't wanna argue um, that jigsaw puzzles are bad and pointillism is good. So we should always use points because they are more accurate in some sort of reflection of reality. Um, rather, we kind of live in a pointillist moment. Um, and I wanna think about what we should do about that. In particular, I wanna embed our discussion of sovereignty uh, in a broader history of um, cartographic boundary making uh, or boundary unmaking um, as really a practice of uh, social sciences and the kind of knowledge um, created by social scientific mapping. So I'm gonna do this in two chunks. Uh, the first will be historical. Um, we've already heard several times about the early 20th century um, as kind of the high point of a certain ideal of state sovereignty. And this is Max Weber, um, the beginnings of international relations theory um, this is the time in the early 20th century when modern assumptions were projected backwards in time onto uh, the Treaty of Westphalia. And I'm going to look at this same moment in the early 20th century, uh, really from the direction of cartography rather than sovereignty. Then in the second chunk, um, it's going to be a bit more forward looking. I'll share some of my own maps um, and try to reflect on what I think these maps are doing. Okay, um, so I'm gonna begin here with an image that might seem rather out of place um, in a conference on cartography, uh, kind of conference on sovereignty, um, which is the classic uh, concentric ring model of American urbanism drawn by the Chicago sociologist, Ernest Burgess in 1923. So the idea here is that uh, downtown Chicago, uh, the loop right in the middle um, is surrounded um, first by a ring of slums, vice and ethnic ghettos and then there are successive rings beyond that, uh, the zone of working men's homes, the residential zone, uh, and finally the commuter zone. This map showed uh, Chicago in particular, um, but it was really meant to represent the spatial ecology of all American cities, um, being driven by the forces of immigration from abroad, the great migration from the South, um, and uh, what seemed um, at the time like an in inevitable process of acculturation and assimilation. One historian has said of this map, uh, quote, there is no more famous diagram in social science. Now I start here because this map um, launched a, a really huge research program um, that lasted almost until World War II, and in many ways set the standard for what social scientific cartography should do. Um, I also think that this project is emblematic of a lot of other similar mapping efforts uh, from the 20th century. The overall goal, uh, was to abstract from the particulars of geographic detail to show the world as made up of relatively stable, well-bounded areas. In particular, the research launched by this diagram started with points and ended up with polygons, um, kind of the opposite of what we're talking about today. So the goal of mapping as a tool of knowledge was to create jigsaw puzzle pieces. So some of the first studies done after this map, um, done by Burgess's students, uh, looked at specific aspects of Chicago. Uh, many of them included uh, maps like this one. These are known as spot maps. 
um, hundreds or thousands of specific uh, locations. Here we have uh, 8,591 alleged male uh, delinquents. Uh, here's another uh, well-known one uh, mapping Chicago's uh, ganglands. Uh, each red dot here shows the location of a different uh, gang. Um, and they made tons and tons of these kinds of maps, uh, showing everything from church membership, um, listings in society, you know, blue books, um, the locations of cabaret dancers uh, and their clients. Um, here is uh, Burgess himself uh, posing in front of another one of these maps. And then these spot maps were treated as a kind of raw material for making uh, jigsaw puzzle shapes. And the process was kind of iterative. Um, the first map they made um, was quite uh, preliminary. It was called the uh, Social Base Map of Chicago, uh, 1926. And you can see they had these little blobs here for uh, different ethnic groups. So you have the big uh, German blob in the north, uh, a couple of Italian and Jewish areas, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, so it's kind of a, a miniature ethnographic map of Europe um, with some clean boundaries, um, but you can still see there's areas of overlap. Uh, and then this was used as a base map for further spot mapping. Um, so you can see, for example, the map of ganglands um, from the very next year, 1927, um, used dots here to investigate how social conflict aligned with ethnicity or not. Um, labeling, for example, uh, the Jewish-Polish uh, frontier uh, running um, at the edge of one of those um, gang districts. Now, as part of this, uh, one of Burgess's PhD students, um, her name was Vivian Palmer, um, wrote uh, what was actually the very first textbook of sociological fieldwork, um, where she went through this process quite explicitly uh, and laid out its ultimate goals. So she said, uh, you first start with what she called a work map, um, showing city data, uh, physical features, et cetera. This was the social base map. Uh, and then you can turn this into a spot map, um, showing everything from individual people to sites of conflict to buildings, um, whatever you want. Uh, and then you would, what she said you would do is you want to group these dots with a series of closed curves. Um, and these closed curves would ultimately reveal um, a, a patchwork of well-organized districts that they called uh, natural or ecological areas. Uh, and they'd be separated by marginal areas of social disorganization. And the idea here was that you would start with lots of different kinds of information. So the railroads, industry, statistics on ethnicity or crime, uh, fieldwork observations of social harmony or chaos. And you'd end up with a single set of boundaries that would cut through all these layers of information. Um, so it's not each layer getting its own set of boundaries, but really bringing it all together to create one set of boundaries. And for Chicago, uh, Palmer and Burgess uh, found exactly 75 of these areas. Uh, on the finished map here, they called them uh, the community areas of the city. And Palmer described them um, really as homogenous chunks of space. She said they were, quote, uh, each a miniature society with its own history and traditions, its own individual problems, its own conception of its future. Uh, Burgess suggested explicitly um, that these were permanent areas of the city uh, for both uh, infrastructural reasons and, and social reasons. And he said that when change would come to such an area, um, it would, quote, uh, tend to affect the whole community as if it were a single unit. Now, Burgess and Palmer, as far as I've been able to find, never talk about sovereignty. Um, they only barely use the nation state um, as a metaphor. But I think it's clear that what they're doing is essentially the same as what we saw Albrecht Pencht doing or other geographers um, around 1919, um, marshalling an array of social scientific data to try to subdivide the world into coherent homogenous districts. And for Burgess and Palmer, this is literally what it meant to do mapping. And in the case of Chicago, their practical goals were, were actually quite successful. Um, they made these community areas into tools of legibility and management. They got the Census Bureau to use these areas to tabulate statistics, um, which meant that they were subsequently used for choropleth mapping of all kinds, uh, everything from housing on the left uh, to schizophrenia on the right. Um, they were adopted by the city as districts for urban planning. Uh, they also became the central way that people in Chicago uh, understood the city. So the city's most famous post-war mayor, Richard J. Daley, 
uh, invoked Burgess's areas when he first began describing Chicago as a city of neighborhoods, which is now its kind of main tagline um, in the 1950s. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a, a city ordinance that conferred official status on the names that Burgess had happened to use uh, on his maps, um, calling them, quote, part of the character and history of Chicago. Now, this is just one little um, tidy example, uh, but I think we really see the same sensibility in lots of cartography uh, well into the late 20th century. So the famous post-war uh, French uh, theorist of graphics, uh, Jacques Bertin, um, who we already heard about, um, he described the purpose of mapping in very similar terms. Uh, he said the goal was to move from lots of complex and disorganized information um, to uh, a finished map of simple shapes with little overlap. One example he used, um, he started with this map here showing natural resources for every state uh, in the United States um, with lots um, of, of overlap and um, kind of you know, bit by bit data. And he ended up after a couple of steps with this. Um, with these a uh, few hard edged um, blobs. And Bertin uh, called this the regionalization of space or simply geographic order. And that was the goal of social scientific mapping. Now Bertin uh, saw this as an essentially apolitical process, um, but we see the same idea at the same time uh, being invoked even by the far left geographer, Bill Bungie uh, for his activist mapping of Detroit. Um, so here is maps, uh, Bungie's map showing Detroit's uh, region of rat-bitten babies. He starts again with points and creates a single homogenous shape. Uh, here's another one of his. Um, here, there's no dots at all. Uh, this is the region of roaches. And Bungie actually used the very same vocabulary. He said the very first task of mapping, um, especially mapping that wanted to engage um, the community, uh, should be regionalization. So in other words, if we zoom way out, um, I think it's not just that cartography is an important anchor of the jigsaw puzzle ideal of sovereignty, although it certainly is. I think it's deeper than that. I think jigsaw puzzleization uh, from the late 19th to the late 20th century uh, really was central to cartography as a form of knowledge, uh, even beyond the specifics of international nation state boundaries. Uh, epistemologically, um, cartography as a social science really was a process for turning uh, points into polygons. So my own entry into the story um, actually came before I knew anything about Burgess or Palmer or spot maps or any of that. Uh, it came when I got an email from a junior high school teacher um, outside of Chicago uh, who had been asking his students uh, to make maps um, of the city in order to understand um, inequality. And they had been having trouble with the map they made of race. Um, so this is what that um, teacher sent me. Um, you can see each area here um, is shaded with various colors and hatch patterns. Uh, they're directly using the community areas um, from Burgess. You can also see it's a bit of a mess, um, in part because the city's demographic, or mainly because the city's demographic patterns uh, no longer align with Burgess's shapes. So what I came up with instead um, used points um, like this. So each of these little dots uh, represents uh, 20 people. The colors here show the standard um, racial ethnic categories of the census. And to me, this was a clearly uh, better map because uh, it showed people instead of uh, shapes. Uh, it showed segregation much more starkly. And if the argument of Burgess's map uh, was that hard borders are the natural condition of the world, um, the argument in my map um, was that blurry gradients uh, really are the more um, natural condition, and it's the hard edges, um, especially around the black neighborhoods of the west side, um, that seem uh, artificial, uh, even shocking. Um, these are the places where we see things being constructed and enforced, um, not things uh, proceeding naturally. Or putting things another way, to me, the obvious goal of mapping as a form of knowledge uh, was to question and challenge boundaries to deconstruct what had been so meticulously constructed. But why was this obvious to me? At the same time I was making this map, I was doing the research for my first book uh, after the map, uh, which traced the transition from the God's eye view of the paper map uh, to the politics of electronic systems like GPS. And one of my key arguments uh, was that traditional representational mapping was an anchor of one form of territoriality, while GPS uh, anchors a rather different form of territoriality. 
one that operates um, through uh, points instead of areas. So this is not a denial of uh, the nation state or of ethno-nationalism. Uh, it was really an argument that pointillist knowledge creates pointillist forms of geographic power. Um, and that this knowledge uh, was a direct challenge to some of the assumptions of the Westphalian uh, model uh, of what Franck Billet, I think, nicely called uh, the volumetric state. So actionable geographic knowledge and intervention are no longer tied to the infrastructures of the jigsaw puzzle state. And there's a kind of cleavage between the jigsaw puzzle nationhood uh, and the more inherently transnational territoriality um, of these electronic points. And one of the details in that book that still sticks with me uh, is a quote from 1993 uh, by the director of the American Association of Geographers, uh, who argued uh, that geographers should, quote, uh, embrace a pointillistic cartography, since, quote, points are basic and robust, while lines, areas, and volumes are derivative. And he made an explicit connection between the pointillism of GPS coordinates, which had just been used for the first time in the Gulf War, and the ability of mapping software uh, to show, quote, individual instances of phenomena, rather than any statistical aggregations. Um, so instead of mapping a forest as a single shape, uh, he said we should now be mapping the individual trees. So in other words, I found myself suddenly embedded in this history. My pointillist mapping of Chicago um, was part of a much broader push to disaggregate and individuate rather than to homogenize and abstract. For me, for the AAG, for the US military, uh, the goals were actually quite similar. Um, to create forms of geographic knowledge uh, that would challenge and span boundaries uh, instead of reinforcing them. And this was a, an important revelation for me. Uh, my goals were in fact not in opposition to contemporary forms of spatial power, but were in fact broadly aligned with them. Now, this does not mean that all power is top-down domination, that academics are the unwitting tools of the military capital or whatever else. Uh, I think it was me, to me, a more of a signal that the, the kind of the goals of mapping had changed. Today, uh, we cringe, uh, rightly so, when we see the 19th and 20th century cartographers projecting their ideals of sharp political boundaries onto ancient empires or non-Western polities. Um, but I think it's important to see our own pointillist impulses as no less historical. Now, in the last few years, um, uh, especially in this book I'm finishing up now that puts my own mapping work uh, into a kind of a larger historical frame, uh, just as you've seen me do here. I've come to more um, comfortably embrace my own historicity. Um, but instead of just focusing on pointillism uh, as one technique, I've been trying to think both theoretically and graphically about the broader impulse of cartographic unbordering. Because um, I do think that mapping as a form of knowledge today um, should be about challenging uh, rather than reinforcing uh, boundaries, or at least investigating to see if the boundaries really are uh, where the maps say they are. But that this can actually be strategic and opportunistic, and we don't need to adopt any particular ontology to do it, an ontology of points or of networks uh, or anything else. So again, it's not that the cure for jigsaw puzzle shapes is points or lines, uh, it's that we should be investigating boundaries instead of taking them for granted. Um, and sometimes we will find uh, that the boundaries are very real indeed. Uh, oftentimes we will find that they are not. So I'm gonna end just by quickly showing three examples of some of these other strategies that I've experimented with over the last um, years. So number one, um, I'm gonna to respond to this here. Um, this is the official US census uh, definition for the boundaries of the American Midwest. But this of course is not the only possible definition of the Midwest and the idea of the Midwest as a cultural idea is in inherently uh, much fuzzier. So I found 100 different maps of the Midwest uh, from a wide variety of organizations uh, and just overlaid them on top of each other. Um, so the very light areas around the edges, uh, these appeared only on uh, a couple of maps, uh, whereas the dark areas in the middle appeared on almost every map. Uh, now it turns out um, there actually was nowhere that appeared on every single map. Um, although Illinois, where I'm from, um, was clearly the leader. Um, so this is strategy number one, uh, blurriness through overlay and collective imagination. Number two, um, there's this very fun survey that I came across uh, that asked people in France 
how many times they kiss their cheeks when they meet a friend. Um, and this is the standard choropleth map uh, that was created from that data. Um, you can see each area is shaded just one color. Two kisses is the overwhelming standard throughout all of France, most of France. So my alternative here to these solid colors, um, after I got the raw data, uh, was to mash together dot mapping and choropleth mapping, um, filling each shape, not with a single color, um, but with a bunch of dots of different colors. I mean, you can see a detail of what that is um, down there. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see what this does just geographically. Suddenly the four kisses, instead of being a couple isolated areas in the North, becomes a very coherent uh, regional minority um, that only a couple times goes above 50%, um, but is in fact um, quite coherent. And it's very um, instructive, I think, to compare that regional minority in the North to the much more tightly bounded regional minority of three kisses in the South. Um, so this is a strategy here of treating these jigsaw puzzle shapes not as homogenous, um, but as containers of pluralism and diversity. Finally, um, example three, uh, here is a map of North American forest regions. Um, and this happens to be a particularly influential amongst forest people uh, map uh, from 1950. Um, I've added the colors here to make it a little easier to see. Now, again, this is an, an exercise in abstraction, homogeneity and bordering. Um, and here, my alternative um, really centers my own experience uh, in New Haven. Um, whoop, yeah. uh, there, so my own experience in New Haven, um, where the colors here are showing um, a, a kind of index of ecological similarity. Um, so this is a, a kind of a, a mathematics you can do to see how similar the trees are in the rest of the continent to the trees that I know uh, in my own local park. Um, so instead of finding myself placed as a resident in one of these blobs with hard edges, I, I'm, I now see a whole spectrum of connection uh, in all directions uh, with some transitions that are quite abrupt, um, many transitions that are um, quite gradual. So this is really a strategy of situated relationality rather than bordered homogeneity. Okay, final thought. For all of these, the forests, the kissing, the Midwest, Chicago, I'm also not really thinking about sovereignty or the state, but I am thinking deeply about bordering, about similarity and difference, about representation, about belonging. So I think the broader provocation here isn't just that these are some cartographic strategies that might be helpful when trying to map the sovereignty regimes of the past or the present. Instead, I think it's that mapping as a technology of sovereignty uh, mapping is a technology of sovereignty, even when it's not about sovereignty. And that bordering, similarity and difference, representation, belonging, uh, these are really the cartographic stuff out of which uh, sovereignty um, is ultimately made. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for the, your patience during that pause. So uh, it would be uh, an understatement to say that U.S. foreign policy over the past few decades has fallen short of its aims. Failures of both prediction and program have been recurrent. Most recently, the consensus was that Russia would crush Ukraine in 48 to 96 hours. Vanishingly few anticipated a successful defense of Kyiv, let alone a prolonged conflict. A few months earlier, experts erred in the opposite direction, uh, confident that Kabul would withstand the Taliban for a prolonged period. No one anticipated the rapid collapse of the Afghan army and government, and no one prepared for the evacuation of US personnel and materials. Uh, more damaging in the long run were a string of US-led or aided regime change gambits and other military ventures in the early 2000s. These backfired spectacularly. After two decades of bloodletting and institution building in Afghanistan, the Taliban had emerged much stronger than it had been before 9-11, able to easily overrun the previously impregnable Panjshir Valley. Iraq was turned into a militia-riven country, partially aligned with Iran. Libya was shattered for years, becoming a hub of weapon smuggling, human trafficking, and much worse. US supported efforts to overthrow Syria's Assad regime fostered a resurgence of radical Islamism and allowed Russia to officially gain permanent access over a 
major air base and uh, port facility. U.S.-backed military uh, intervention uh, in Yemen by Saudi Arabia and the UAE resulted in a deadly stalemate and a human rights catastrophe. Over the same period, the rise of an authoritarian China, globally ambitious and increasingly hostile to the United States, likewise defied confident predictions. The Washington consensus was that enriching China would veer steadily into liberalism and democracy, its participation in global trade networks, tightening the bonds of an increasingly peaceful Cold War order. Many foreign policy analysts welcomed the growing entanglement of the American and Chinese economies, seeing Chimerica as an economically stabilizing force that guaranteed cheap inflation busting imports. Warning of a potential totalitarian resurgence in the one party People's Republic were given little credence. Now, it's all too easy uh, to use hindsight to castigate foreign policy decisions and intelligence omissions, or to assume the different paths would have necessarily led to better outcomes. Given the complexities of geopolitics, uh, miscues are inevitable. It's also easy to overlook foreign policy successes as the human mind inherently foregrounds the negative over the positive. Uh, that said, there's a consistent uh, pattern of error when costly choices repeatedly yield the opposite of what had been intended, inquiry into the deeper cause, uh, roots are call, called for. Uh, despite uh, widespread concurrence in Washington, many critics warned against all of these regime change gambits. Although the most concerted opposition came from the political left and academic foreign policy circles, it was most closely associated with the anti-liberal realist school of international relations. Although realists tend to uphold liberal principles in the domestic sphere, they hotly oppose trying to impose them elsewhere. According to John Mearsheimer, the dean of this informal school, the post-Cold War effort of the United States to, quote, remake the world in its own image was based on a great delusion of liberal hegemony. In his view, self-interested nationalism is far more potent than either humanitarianism or the desire for liberty. Accordingly, sovereign states are expected to doggedly pursue their own interests, regardless of whatever laudable schemes are embraced by progressive intellectuals or advanced by the international community. Realists in this view are those who acknowledge this reality and act accordingly, upholding balance of power rivalries, even when they run roughshod over human rights and responsibilities. Uh-oh. Ah. <laughs> small glitch there anyway. Uh, after the uh, overwhelming uh, failures of US interventions in the Middle East and the authoritarian surge in China, many observers have inclined in a more realist direction, although it would be a gross exaggeration to say that we are all realists now. Liberal internationalism is still the dominant establishment paradigm, but is now a chastened version of what had been a more muscular creed. Mearsheimer and his fellow realists uh, have been proven prescient though and deserve some credit. But if realism, illustrate some of the key problems in US foreign policy, its own shortcomings are equally apparent. Fundamental failures to understand the global order are evident in Mearsheimer's influential 2014 essay, Why the Ukraine Crisis is the West's Fault. Here he argued that Moscow was the aggrieved party in the 2014 war, owing to NATO's push into its legitimate sphere of influence. Russia's annexation of Crimea and the hiving off of the two Donbass People's Republics, in other words, were defensive acts. Mearsheimer insisted that Putin is a conventional geopolitical actor, a realist himself, who acts like the leader of almost any great power would if faced with similar threats. He thus confidently predicted that Russia's aims would remain strictly limited. Quote, Putin surely understands that trying to subdue Ukraine would be like swallowing a porcupine. Well, in early 2022, Russia did indeed try to subdue Ukraine, invalidating Mearsheimer's prediction and calling into question his ability to discern Putin's motivations based on realist assumptions. But as the massive invasion commenced, Mearsheimer doubled down, employing the same porcupine metaphor and giving the same assurances of limited aims. Quote, it does seem apparent that Putin is not touching Western Ukraine. He opined just a few days before Moscow launched a missile attack on 
Lviv in far western Ukraine, the first of many such attacks. In Mirsheimer's understanding at the time, Putin would never attempt to subdue Ukraine because doing so would be too expensive and destructive, weakening Russia. Following a clear-cut theory, he expected Putin to coldly calculate his maneuvers, acting in a manner deemed rational by the tenets of realism. As Jan Smolensky and Jan Dutkovitz aptly frame it, Mearsheimer and other foreign policy figures were treating Russia's Ukraine, invasion of Ukraine like a game of risk. No, not literally, because in that case, Ukraine already won before the game started. Uh, realist analysis paid little attention to Putin's own justification, which he spelled out before the invasion. Uh, given Putin's craving to extend Russian hegemony over its near abroad, compounded with a widespread Russian belief in the redemptive power of mass suffering, it is not surprising that he would have taken a self-damaging course. Contrary to realist theorizing, political myths and ideologies can matter tremendously, as noted here by Alec Murphy, and they not infrequently lead in destructive directions. If one imbibes enough hyper-nationalist fables, even the world's largest porcupine can be a tempting target, as the world learned to its horror in June 1941. It is impossible to make sense of the 2022 Russia-Ukraine war in Mearsheimer's framework. If it reflected reality, Russia would have continued bullying Kyiv and jockeying for geopolitical advantage rather than launching an outright invasion. And Ukraine, for its part, uh, should have complied with Russian demands. As a minor power on a flat landscape, it supposedly had no chance of withstanding its great power neighbor and was fated instead to be a defanged buffer country at best or a Russian puppet at worst. As Mearsheimer rightly emphasizes, the conflict is embedded in national sentiments, but understanding how nationalism function requires making distinctions between different forms of the phenomenon, as also noted by Murphy. Following Hans Kohn, many scholars have differentiated ethnic from civic nationalism. The former is present premised on the emotionally charged belief in descent from a locally rooted ancestral population that remains, remains bound together by a common language and cultural practices. The latter is based on allegiance to political ideals. Mearsheimer scoffs at this distinction. In his view, civic ties are too vague and cerebral to be meaningful. Instead, nationalism needs to be cemented by an emotional belief in the sacred nature of the national territory if people are going to be willing to fight and die for it. Uh, this interpretation accords well with those of ethno-national theorist Yoram Hazani and pundit Rich Lowry, who argue that genuine national solidarity has to rest on ethnic pillars. These influential authors reject the traditional bipartisan consensus uh, in civic nationalism in the United States, which is lodged instead in loyalty to a liberal Republican political creed. Now, there are a lot of problems with the civic ethnic distinction, but it is nonetheless essential for understanding the Russia-Ukraine conflict. The ideology that informs Putin's invasion is one of ethnic essentialism fixated on the world historical destiny of the Russian people spiritually intertwined with the Russian Orthodox Church. It deviates from garden variety ethno-nationalism by virtue of its imperial pretensions. Although Russia is a highly centralized country, Putin's Eurasianist uh, perspective frames it not as a singular nation state, but rather as the core of a multinational domain, one structured around internal ethnic republics, external unrecognized client states, buffer countries, and an expansive sphere of influence. And we can just run through some different maps showing this. Uh, based on different organizations and different uh, um, dreams, if you will. Uh, and I can uh, end up here, uh, including Mongolia, because if you take that Eurasianist perspective seriously, I think Munk would agree with this, Mongolia is part of it or, or would be. And actually, Russia is constitutionally designated not as a nation state, but as a multinational federation with sovereignty officially, uh, where well, you can't see up there, it's supposed to say uh, de jure, not de facto, uh, vested in its ethno-nationally distinct people. While there is no doubt that the Russian ethno-nations forms its core, many others are recognized and granted cultural space, 
The very existence of the Ukrainian nation, on the other hand, is denied with the Ukrainians deemed to be a more mere local variant of the greater Russian ethnos. Mearsheimer's realism overlooks both the pathologies of ethno-nationalism and the potentialities of civic nationalism. These pathologies are sadly familiar. National stories tend to be mythologized, leading to damaging historical falsification. Imperial visions such as Russia's foster delusions of destiny that often end in violent imperial overreach. When false narratives are enshrined, truth-telling becomes subversive and repression follows. Minority groups are typically excluded from the national core and often from the nation itself. Should they become disgruntled enough to, dis to rebel, the state is weakened. The dismissal of civic nationalism by both Mearsheimer and right-wing populists is also unsupportable as again demonstrated by recent events in Ukraine. Although a sense of common belonging and desire for independence have long been evident uh, across Ukraine, even Crimea voted for independence in 1991. Uh, uh, Ukrainian national identity was poorly consolidated before 2014. Uh, to be sure, ethno-national bonds were firm across the North and West, often taking an extreme form in the far West. In and around Lviv, the Svoboda party, intensely anti-Russian, anti-communist, and anti-Semitic, routinely gained up to 30% of the vote. Eastern and Southern Ukraine, on the other hand, strongly favored candidates like Viktor Yanukovych, who downplayed language, sought close relations with Russia, and advocated extensive decentralization. Election after election revealed this sharp bifurcation, with candidates who received more than 90% of the vote on one end of the country receiving less than 10% on the other. Such an electoral disjunction seen most starkly in Nigeria signals a poorly gelled nation. But Ukraine's national rift began to heal over after the Russian assault of 2014. The most pro-Russian areas, Crimea and Eastern Donbass, were excised from the country, while Putin's brutal actions undermine the pro-Russia view. More importantly, a new version of Ukrainian nationalism was put forward by the most unlikely of candidates, the comedian Volodymyr Zelensky. As a Russian-speaking Jew who defended the public use of his mother language, the sense that he does not even count as a Ukrainian in the more hidebound uh, versions of his country's ethno-national creed. By urging respect for Russian language institutions, he provoked hostility from extremists. Zelensky's brand of nationalism had no room for emotional zealotry, religious inflection, or mythologizing the greatness of the Ukrainian past. Instead, he grounded his electoral campaign on a quintessential civic issue, an anti-corruption drive. Zelensky first gained traction in Ukraine's formerly Russia-friendly East and South. In the final voting round, however, he triumphed almost everywhere, uh, except in the far West. But even there, support for the fascist Svoboda party had essentially evaporated. Zelensky's civic nationalism had apparently consolidated the nation, at least temporarily. And when push came to shove, Ukrainians stunned the world with their willingness to fight and die for their land and state. Civically fortified and militarily tested, Ukrainian national consolidation now looks secure. Although Mearsheimer blames the ill-fated regime change maneuvers supported or undertaken by the United States on a naive liberal drive to refashion the world, the failure of his own theorizing to make sense of the Russia-Ukraine conflict shows that the underlying problem runs deeper. Again and again, realists and interventionists alike fail to anticipate the consequences of their policy. Why? I argue that their common flaw is to accept without question a simplistic world map and model. According to this all but universal scheme, which has been deftly criticized here over the last two days, the world is cleanly divided into a set number of sovereign states. These entities are regarded as fundamental, vastly more important than their own subdivisions or any supranational entities, cross-cutting political organizations or intersecting networks. Their significance is all encompassing, extending well beyond geopolitics. They literally form the base map out of which almost all global spatial information is inscribed. In the process, they are inevitably 
nationalized. As Bill Rankin has written, borders separating countries, quote, become part of a neutral landscape with an almost timeless presence. And they're conspicuously disconnected from the dynamic contingent human knowledge layered on top. It is a deliberately simple trick and its simplicity is what makes it so powerful. While not all important, states certainly are enormously significant. And to comprehend them, one needs to understand their geo history, asking when, where, and how they originated and in what manner they spread across the world. Although no consensus has been reached in the vast literature on the topic, most IR scholars agree that the modern state arose in Western Europe in the early modern period. In the larger IR narrative, European states gained the key attributes of full sovereignty and complete territorialization with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. The sovereign state then spread through both imposition and emulation across the world. Tribal and nomadic people, such as those of Inner Asia, were among the last to be encompassed within its bounds. By the late 20th century, the system was globalized with the sovereign state forming the puzzle pieces of the master jigsaw map of the planet. How my titles are gone. A challenging puzzle. Correctly oriented now. Small ones are the most difficult. They're coming together. And that's the world, right? Now, according to the standard model, these fundamental units are not just sovereign territorial units governing cleanly demarcated territories. They're also nation states, implying the state is fully congruent with the nation, the people following under its rule. This equation is encoded in the very term international relations. The correspondence is assumed to be so strong that state, nation, and country have become interchangeable. According to Mearsheimer, nations themselves, quote, tend to be tightly integrated permanent entities separated by clear borders. These platonic entities, as they have been deemed by Nassim Taleb, are presumed to be the world's essential actors. In international law, they are reduced to singular persons who in concert constitute a cozy international community. The standard world model is concise and convenient and almost entirely wrong. Reducing the past to a few key events, it is essentially a historical. Locating all crucial developments on Eurasia's Western fringe, it is inherently Eurocentric. As Munker Dean showed in his talk yesterday, pastoral peoples of Central Asia built powerful states with key territorial aspects centuries, really millennia ago. State emergence was a prolonged process with the fully modern form, Charles Myers Leviathan 2.0, not appearing until the second half of the 19th century. Jordan Branch, more daringly yet convincingly, argues that the state per se has no time or place of origin, being a composite institution whose various components all have their own histories and geographies. As the papers in this conference further show, geopolitical reality has always been vastly more complex and chaotic than the world model allows. Across the globe, sovereignty has always been fractionated, nesting, diffused, disputed. Borders are often contested and are not infrequently more notional than real. Effectively stateless areas abound as do archipelagic counter states uh, with militarily and as well militarily potent states within states. National identity is often questioned and never uniform. States and nations rarely line up with exactitude. And contemporary states are certainly not polities of the same sort. For starters, it matters that they differ by orders of magnitude in population and area. Uh, even countries with comparable populations vary so much in their capacity and infrastructure as to be different kinds of entities. Composite constructions that exist simultaneously in the realm of ideas, infrastructures, and representations in uh, uh, Jordan Branch's formulation, states are nothing like persons. What this means is that we re is that we have misconstrued the map. The standard world map does not depict the worlds as it is. It represents the ideals of the diplomatic community. In the rarefied realm of diplomacy, resorting to simplification is reasonable, even desirable. But when the goal is understanding the world and the motives of its actors, the model does more harm than good. If we are to devise effective policies, we need to grapple with the world in its full complexities. 
relying on such an idealized image to guide policies and generate forecasts will only lead to more dismay and disappointment. Here as well, the scholarship showcase case in this conference comes in. As Frank B.A. emphasizes, mainstream geopolitical scholarship frames deviation as exception, dismissing any challenge to the underlying scheme. In the contemporary world, nation state uniformity is assumed to have overridden the pre-modern order of partialized sovereignty and layered and overlapping political identity, bringing about, in Mearsheimer's words, again to quote, an extraordinary change from a heterogeneous world to a homogeneous one. But in actuality, divergence from the geopolitical norm is less the exception than the substance of the geopolitical architecture today. The more one looks, the more one finds. As Bruno Latour insisted in a different context, we have never been modern. We fool ourselves in thinking otherwise. Moving beyond the game board view to grapple with the actual configuration of political power can be extraordinarily difficult. Trying to map something as spatially amorphous as the Millet system of confessional legal autonomy in the early in the Ottoman Empire challenges the cartographic imagination. I didn't even try. But it doesn't mean we should give up on visualization. If anything, it makes the mapping of political authority more crucial, if only because the effort to get it right exposes just how slippery and intricate sovereignty can be. Grappling with these intricacies has pushed cartographers to further hone their craft, as Lucas Schultz and others have demonstrated. Sometimes, uh, however, conventional mapping is not up to the task, especially when we want to move above and below the surface plane. And as Barbara Mundi concludes, our understanding of especially difficult issues can sometimes be enhanced by linking cartography with artistic presentations. The failed regime change gambits of the early 21st century with which I began this presentation are substantially rooted in the standard world model. Having naturalized the state, we can't help but expecting to be, uh, we can't uh, help but expecting it to be more secure than it often is. We thus imagined the imagined communities that we call Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, uh, no, Libya and Afghanistan, that they would withstand the shock of imposed new regimes, even if done so through foreign aggression. Japan, after all, had no problem staying in one piece after its devastating defeat, defeat and occupation in 1945. Yet the regime change gambit of the early century sons did the crumpling of the targeted states and the breaking of their nations followed by prolonged conflict. Libya and Afghanistan may have been tentatively reconstructed, but they remain precarious. Iraq persists as something of a sham state, surviving only of the insistence of the international community. Its self-governing and self-defended Kurdish regional government would opt out in a heartbeat if only it could. In Yemen, the nation was revealed not uh, to have been much more of a figment of the imagination than a reality of the world map. Prior to the regime changing uh, operations, it was less national solidarity than the raw power of their governments that held any of these countries together. All moreover have been challenged by powerful countervailing ideologies, ranging from radical Islamism to Arab nationalism. Again, I'm sorry, the title of that is not uh, uh, visible. Uh, and again, Arab nationalism, associated ideologies with Arab nationalism. Uh, to conflicted Kurdish nationalism, to anarcho-libertarian socialism, deeply conflicted as well, uh, to Pashtun ethno-imperialism. This is not to say that these countries completely lack unifying sentiments. Like other states without ethno-national or civic foundations, they develop some measure of common identity through other means. Mearsheimer emphasizes the solidarity boosting struggle for independence against colonial powers. While significant anti-colonialism itself was insufficient to generate enduring solidarity. More important have been state-run schools, a nation-focused press, and the simple experience of living under a common government. But although public opinion polling usually shows widespread, widespread acceptance of the nation state, that doesn't mean that the notion is necessarily taken to heart. When crisis hits, ethnic, regional, and clan-based identity can quickly trump nation-state loyalty. The world's youngest nation, South Sudan, cohered well enough when fighting for independence, but collapsed almost immediately upon receiving it. 
because allegiance of most of its people remained with the Dinka, Nuer, and other local groups. Now, this world probably would be much more stable and peaceful if it accorded with the nation state model. But just as confusing is for ought can lead to mindless conservatism, as David Hume warned long ago, confusing ought for is can lead to senseless naivete. A truly realistic pers realist perspective would deal with the world as it is constituted, not as imagined. Such genuine realism, however, faces resistance because it can be construed as threatening the institutions that underwrite what little geopolitical stability actually exists. If we are all to quit pretending, such thinking has it, everything could collapse as political cohesion ultimately rests on legitimacy in the public imagination. Although rarely expressed overtly, this concern sometimes makes itself its presence felt. I was recently chided by a senior colleague for arguing that the Peace of Westphalia, contrary to IR theory, did not create anything like a system of individuated sovereign states. He did not fault my evidence or my arguments. What bothered him was their implications. But if the devastating failures of US foreign policy are any indication, what is more dangerous is devising regimes under the guidance of an illusion. International relations scholarship is concerned with both theory and practice, but theory comes first. As Mearsheimer specifies, theory is indispensable for understanding how the world works. In one profound sense, he is not wrong. Theorizing of some sort is necessary to understand anything. But experimentally unfalsifiable theories are best held as provisional interpretations that can shift or be abandoned as new developments unfold. In the sciences, competing theories are routinely put to the test and those that failed are winnowed out. That is not the case, however, in geopolitics. But as it turns out, a trove of relevant experimental data has been collected on the conceptualization of geopolitically significant events. A robust IR theory ought to facilitate forecasting near-term developments. The available evidence, however, suggests otherwise. For decades, Philip Tetlock has been running massive tournaments in which individuals and teams compete to see who can best forecast the likelihood of such events as North Korea launching another missile or Argentina defaulting on its bonds. The results are not good PR for IR. In one study, according to Tetlock, the average expert performed at the level of a dart throwing chimpanzee. <laughs> Scholars and pundits whose predictions fare worse are those animated by a single big idea. Tetlock paints those most susceptible to this bias as theory poisoned. By contrast, a few people are super forecasters who have better track records. Intriguingly, those with the knack turn out to be generalists, not specialists. They typically follow a modest strategy, gathering as much information as possible and adjusting their predictions as they go along. Super forecasters regard theories as hypotheses. Driven by curiosity, they have high levels of general knowledge. They are the kind of people, Tetlock tells us, who can find Kazakhstan on a map. Tetlock's research confirms my doubt about the standard approach to sovereignty that dominates geopolitical analysis. Given as well the dismal record of US foreign policy, a new paradigm is surely called for. Ultimately, that's what this conference is all about. And the most promising alternative, I would argue, has been displayed in this room. This room of marvels is what it says up there over the past two days. It's one based on learning the spatial complexities of political power on the ground and analyzing how they are imagined, represented, legitimated, and contested. The work showcased here shows a richly variegated, multidimensional, literally three-dimensional, landscape that cannot be reduced to a single model, much less reflected on a single map. Our alternative approach relies heavily on cartography to depict, interpret, and appreciate that landscape, but it always puts multiple maps in dialogue with each other and in dialogue with textual accounts. It sees maps as laden proposition, not mirrors of reality. As we have seen, map makers in earlier areas eras often had a more had a sophisticated understanding of this truth. Uh, in Lucas Schultz's paper, uh, he shows how early modern cartographers often understand that there were much better ways to visualize the Holy Roman Empire 
than to painstakingly differentiate every one of its nano polities. You look at atlases of the time, and it's usually imperial circles. That's what's depicted, not every little, you know, three village nunnery that has imperial immediacy. Uh, early 18th century Russian map makers, as Valerie Kivelson demonstrates, uh, viewed the Tsar's Siberian realm not as a firmly demarcated imperial territory, but rather as a dappled zone of tribute exaction. Uh, in today's historical atlases, in contrast, the Russian Empire circa 1700 is just a big piece on a master puzzle. Peter Bull shows it in the faltering late Ming, map makers in Southern China foregrounded a lineage-based political order contravening imperial norms. Today, genealogical reckoning is returning to the region. But in other parts of the world as well, real and fictive kinship networks have enormous, if generally unacknowledged geopolitical salience. In the post, invasion chaos of Iraq, U.S. military forces uh, were forced to recognize this reality and work through the cartographically all but invisible tribal order. Rescuing history from the nature as, from the nation as Persenjit Gora framed it a quarter century ago is a well advanced project by now in the humanities. But recognition in one corner of the university does not mean acknowledgement across the disciplines, much less in the public sphere. Outside of academia, the pared down political map is still a hegemonic script, as noted here by uh, Guntram Erb. More, much more than the study of history, in other words, need to, needs to be rescued from the nation and from the state and from blanket sovereignty and from all the other trappings of the standard world model. Put another way, we might say that it is the practice of statecraft that needs to be rescued by the study of history and geography. Perhaps John Mearsheimer would be open to this assessment. He too was warned of the dangers of geographical illiteracy. In the early 20th first century, he lamented the United States was intervening in countries it knew astonishing little about. Few government officials even knew that Sunni and Shia were different branches of Islam. Well, if officials had known such things, and if they had understood that Iraq is not a permanent puzzle piece on a stable world map, but rather a tenuous construction that was conjured into existence by Winston Churchill, Gertrude Bell, and other imperial functionaries following the United Kingdom's betrayal of its Arab allies after World War I, perhaps a less destructive path would have been taken in 2003. Thank you. And all. <laughs> Thank you to all of our speakers in this uh, long final panel. And thanks to all of you who are still with us. Um, but we've had a lot, packed a lot of punch into the last hour and a half. And let's go ahead and take an extra 10 or 15 minutes for questions and discussion. Thanks. This was this was a really dazzling panel. Um, I am fully convinced by what everyone said about adding more suppleness to cartographic practice and getting away from these puzzle piece states. Um, I'm wondering a little bit if history is getting flattened <laughs> in the process of adding subtlety to the map side. Um, the, the, and this is really drawing back on Alex's presentation earlier, where I was utterly convinced by the, def, the distinction between the, the kind of affective nation and the, and the civic nation. But then just now listening to Martin, I'm wondering, can we use those kinds of models? You talked about the shift in Ukrainian sense of the nation, and it's really dramatic. And the fact that Zelensky is president of Ukraine is something that would have been unthinkable if we'd been stuck in models of how Ukraine's supposed to act. On the other hand, uses of history and claims by Putin have changed over the years. Remember bare-chested, uh, heroic, 
Putin, the macho man who turned somehow into the orthodox, um, you know, pious leader. So where do we know, how do we know where to fix what the history tells us this nation is as we're thinking about the, the, the implications for, for today and for, for maps? I'll take a first stab at that. And my answer is simple, learn more history and learn more geography. If you look at the way would-be foreign policy experts are trained in programs and international relations across the country, what do they take? Well, they take IR theory, they take lots of econ ec economics, lots of econometrics, lots of statistical modeling, uh, often things like game theory. I'm not saying these things are useful, useless. Sometimes they are. Sometimes it gets a little strange Lovian, but what they're not learning, they're not learning geography of the world. I mean, I, I taught world geography here for 20 years and were people in international relations interested in having their students take those classes? No. Were they interested in having students take classes in Russian history and Ottoman history and all the other history classes we have? By and large, no. I have a question, uh, this is Peter Bull. I have a question when the chance I was arises. Respond as well. um, uh, just to say, I think that the, um, maybe I'm just agreeing with you that the, uh, to not flatten the jigsaw puzzle map as, as uh, the obvious thing that it seems to be. And that in fact, um, the way if you, you know, so I, I've done some mapping trying to basically tick, pick apart how the United States operates territorially. Um, it's super complex, right? And, we, and we've, we've heard many of uh, kind of gestures towards that, the different kinds of territories, the different ways that of in, indigenous sovereignty is understood or not, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that those, um, you know, the, the state not as a unitary actor understands those things, right? And those things are in fact quite real. Um, and they're in fact enacted in exactly the way, that, like the people making these th things work this way know what they're doing, right? And those are different people than the people who are making the, the Rand McNally Atlas or something like that, right? So I, th I think there is something, maybe, th maybe the way I would agree with you is to say, um, there's a real case to be made for very careful mapping of a traditional sort of all of those various complexities of sovereignty, um, not from the kind of thing that I'm doing, trying to break apart you know, bits and pieces of it, but to say what in fact is the territory of the United States? Um, how would we actually represent that in an atlas in a way that's different or better than uh, kind of on its own terms, right? Um, so maybe that would be way to say like the, everything I was talking about are things that I like to do. I think we should do more of them, um, but that's not to say we shouldn't also be very careful about the way we map the, the, the world of borders actually, you know, even political borders as it actually exists, so. Uh, Fascinating presentations, and uh, some are really scary, <laughs> I have to say. Um, I had one question from uh, Luca. Um, uh, I don't know if it is a question or a comment. Um, you subscribe to James Scott's notion of canceling sovereignties, sort of, you know, in the sort of peripheral areas where the, 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 the sort of um, competing claims of sovereignty. And I think if I understood you correctly, you're applying that uh, to the Holy Roman Empire and shown that as a case where these people, you know, the, the peasants uh, appeal to the high court, etc. But I think that seems to be not that um, shown the case. It, it, what I see is, you know, there is an imperial sovereignty or, or imperium that controls it. It's actually not the absence or canceling of different sovereign claims. And I don't think that the Holy Roman Empire fits to what James Scott argues. The Holy Roman Empire is actually, it's, it's actually what, uh, um, um, James Heavier argued for the 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 Qing Empire. It's the the one sort of overarching overlordship or multitude of lordship. 
that yeah you... yeah thanks um I mean, I guess what I was trying to do with that map was not so much make a general point about the nature of the Holy Roman Empire. And I think, I mean, obviously it would be very, yeah, I'd, 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 I would agree with you. That would be a, a somewhat spurious um, uh, comparison. But I think what I liked about um, the, the the graphic, the diagram that Scott inserted there, that I thought it was a very simple, but a very effective way of, um, of showing what, um, um, what, what, how overlapping claims of dominion can be can be visualized and i guess um, um and i think these are situations that you find very much in the holy roman empire and also how um how that can be framed yeah in in, in different terms so i guess my point was more cartographic here rather than about the yeah but um mm -hmm. thanks uh, uh, then the next question from field rankin and also um um sorry barbara mondi was just to say uh, what Barbara and you ask, like, I'm, I'm really close to that. But what are you talking about is, is really, really scary, you know. And I actually would like to stay with the cartographic sovereignty instead of this pointless sovereignty, you know, pointillism. Basically, you're, I think, probably the, the, the cards or the maps were somehow somewhat like a blanket. You can hide behind that, you know, blanket. It's not really sort of, you know, surveillance thing what are you talking about is what actually the things with this the the power of digital technology seems to be like you know it's now becoming just the personal control the, the each what i understood is the each point in in uh sorry martin's presentation of the the this the votes for Zelensky. you know the whole thing it's again i think the part of the surveillance technology and part of the surveillance state. And I think from that, what I would think is, you know, the sovereignty, cartographic sovereignty is no longer, you know, it probably it's out of date now. And it's becoming basically surveillance sovereignty, isn't it? And it, it scares me actually, you know, because it's going to be just every one of us, after every one of us. And especially if we, don't change the the you know whatever we call democracy it's going to empower those in power so i think the way i respond to that is to not disagree necessarily but to say i i don't know that there's a monolithic actor behind it um then in, in fact what we have is kind of multiple overlapping institutions of power each operating with its own form of power so, for example, in just the, the specifics of it, uh, the geolocation technology uh, is not the the GPS has created, funded, operated by the government is not at all a tracking technology. In fact, the military designed it specifically so it could not be used for tracking, but it has been turned into a tracking technology by private companies. Um, and often people buy the ability to track their kids or, you know, um, whatever, whatever. Right. Um, and at the same time, other parts of the state are very much still operating as a jigsaw puzzle piece, right? Uh, with homeland security and the borders and all that kind of stuff happening at the same time, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't disagree with you that it's scary or that there's something uh, that, that there's a, the individuation of power is not something necessarily to celebrate. Um, but I would just say that I, I don't know it's that there is the state that is doing this. And certainly in, uh, in the US, it is certainly not even just the state. Right. There's the state is doing some things and private actors are doing many other things. And often it's the overlap of that that creates um, the power that is much more pernicious um, or insidious than each acting individually. Uh, I'll leave it to others to comment on, on other places in the world um, where that that overlap might be different or ne differently negotiated. Um, but I think that that's maybe, maybe the way that I would I would respond to that. Peter has a question for Bill. Um, this is for Bill Rankin. Um, so this points versus polygons is something that, of course, in doing historical GIS has always been an issue uh, because polygons are really, really hard to justify and points are straightforward in some, in some sense. Um, but I thought for a long time that in China, um, the administrative system was basically a point-based system and the tax system was a point-based system as people lived in villages. The only time you needed to draw a boundary something was when you had plots of land. And we don't see maps showing plots of land. We see booklets showing each parcel 
depicted with its tax burden. Borders matter on roads, but by and large, people say the travel distance from one point to another. And then if there's a road between the two places, you have to specify who has jurisdiction at some point. Borders matter um, in, 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 for, for war, be, but those borders are never constant. Yet, and, and so when our, my Chinese colleagues got really interested in doing polygons for everything over our objections, I thought this, this is really the influence of Western uh, cartography coming to China, right? Uh, and all of a sudden, they, people want to have polygons for everything. And in fact, when I brought this up, and they said, well, no one will think we've made a contribution unless we do polygons. So <laughs> they were really committed to doing polygons. But recently, I've been looking at some uh, 18th century, early 18th century Chinese local histories, and local gazetteers. And it does seem that they have become far more concerned with administrative boundaries than before. And so that they themselves, before really the influence of Western cartography, were moving in the direction of, of a polygon cartography. And th this gets me to my question, which is, if you have to do an intellectual history of Western cartography, went from point base to polygon which then now you're, you know, you're, 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 you're thrusting against and arguing for pointillism. Um, but I'm interested in what happened in the history of Western cartography for this. Obviously, it's a huge question. Um, I, uh, my own uh, expertise and argument doesn't go much before the late 19th century. Um, but I would say that I, I wouldn't argue for that. And maybe the, the answer um, is shares a certain form with what I, the answer I, I gave earlier, which is that my understanding, again, mostly from others' research um, in 18th, early 19th century, um, is that you have multiple forms um, of knowledge operating at the same time. Um, so the cadastral system will be quite different from the kinds of knowledge being made um, for the defense or for, um, and coastal surveying is done in a very different way from interior surveying and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and that there is this, the grand fiction is that all these things will eventually line up and be part of this, of, of one national mapping project. Um, so I think that and that to me is a very convincing and nice way to, to think about it, which is that there's there's no master narrative possible because there's not actually coherence at any one time. Um, and so my argument today was really uh, focused on the, the sort of social scientific cartography, not touching the way that the cartography is being done by the state at this time or uh, road atlases or th things like that, right? Um, so I think that there's there's a lot to be said for resisting the urge to say uh, build these kinds of master narratives that that combine maps from all sor sorts of different domains uh, into a certain theory of state or power or whatever at a particular time. Um, yeah, I just add one thing on the Chicago your discussion of Chicago it would have been interesting to extend that to Rob Sampson's work and his <clears throat> his GIS work on Chicago, which and how you would see that relating back to the 1920s and 30s, 40s work on Chicago. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know that project. I would love to, if you could send me that, it would be look, love to look at it. I do know the like the Encyclopedia of Chicago, you know, there's been, geographers been working on Chicago and it's uh, remarkable how much, if not the the same boundaries that Burgess created are the same, it's just the same basic idea that you can, if Chicago is a neighborhood, a city of neighborhoods, we need to find the neighborhoods. Um, and that seems to be the task that, that people set for themselves. And then they, they, they figure out how to, how to draw the boundaries in a slightly different way or something like that. Thanks. All right, in the interest of time, because there's a business meeting for participants afterwards, I'm afraid this is at the end of our question and answer session. And I understand Salim would like to say a few words to close out the program. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I do. Uh, I, I, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, thank a slew of folks. Um, and so uh, bear with me and my very large face on the screen uh, for a moment. Um, we've been the recipients of uh, both David and Abby Rumsey's ideas, intellectual wealth, and unwavering support of the David Rumsey Map Center and its resources. Uh, you've enjoyed much of these uh, in the last two days. And for that, I think I speak for many of us, if not all of us, uh, we're grateful and thankful uh, to, to the Ramses for that. 
Uh, we at the center are also very, very much appreciate the support from our leadership, uh, namely Mike Keller and Julie Sweetkind Singer, uh, who steadfastly uh, support our uh, projects, including this one. Um, I also I just want to quickly take the opportunity once again uh, uh, thank the organizers, uh, Karen and Martin, uh, for you know so for organizing this conference and for Yuki Hoshini for working behind the scenes as well, uh, and of course to all of our speakers, uh, both their talks as well as their exhibits, uh, the, the moderators and our keynote Barbara Mundi, who gave us such a captivating talk yesterday. Uh, thank you all for a fantastic conference. Um, the center is a richer place for all of your contributions, uh, which will remain in our recordings. Uh, they'll go out later. Uh, last uh, but not least, I want to once again thank my immediate colleagues, uh, Tyler, Christina, Laura, uh, Todd, and ha Hassan. Uh, in particular, uh, Tyler for working the Zoom magic and managing the technology, a wonderful job. Uh, Tyler, uh, for, for Christina, who was in charge of the exhibition, both the physical and the digital, which I think you will all agree was done very well. Uh, a round of applause uh, to, to these folks who have been working very hard. Um, uh, I also want to call out Mario uh, Pamploma. He's the user services and privileges librarian and his colleagues at Access Services uh, for making the entry and exit of our attendees a smooth one, including pre-registration, which is something new. Uh, a shout out to Dirna Fazel, who worked with Christina to use some of uh, her physical exhibit tools and expertise, and to Kathy Astor uh, with respect to the digital exhibition. Uh, it really took uh, the Stanford Library Village to make this happen, and I'm, I'm grateful to be part of it. Um, uh, for, for most of you who are, who are going to be leaving uh, after the session, uh, go forth, enjoy the great California weather. I wish you a wonderful, long, and safe weekend. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. We missed you. Thank you.